today's talk, I wanted to highlight a little bit of research. I don't even know if it's fair to call it exactly research, more like clinical reports based upon some science that seems to form the basis for some research on a technique called vestibular stimulation, which can do many interesting things from a psychiatric point of view, amongst them, according to existing case reports, it may be able to reduce mania, to reduce symptoms of psychosis, and to promote, promote or improve insight where insight has been impaired associated with a mental illness, and to do so without medicines. So it's if a portion of the findings can be translated into clinical practice, this has a potential to be paradigm shifting. So let me just introduce you to vestibular stimulation and what the potential may be. Since we're going to talk about vestibular stimulation, let's talk about what we mean by vestibular. I'm talking here about the vestibular system, which consists of this tiny and intricate and sophisticated bony structure inside the ear, in the inner ear, in the inner ear. The vestibular system consists of, I'm going to call it five structures simplistically, three rings and two acceleration detecting zones. The rings are called semicircular canals. Here you can see one here. You can see it's kind of vertically oriented. Here's one here. You can see it's kind of horizontally oriented. And here's one that seems to be in uh, another perpendicular plane. These semicircular canals are filled with fluid and they are oriented in X, Y, and Z axis. Anytime we move our head in a turning in an angular way, we cause fluid inside of those canals to move. And the movement of fluid is detected by special organs at the base of these canals. That is hooked up to a vestibular nerve. And that's how our brains are able to, to detect turning motions or angular acceleration. And we're going to talk about the the vestibular stimulation we're going to talk about focuses exclusively on the semicircular, on one of the semicircular canals, actually. But to just make it complete, let me also talk to you about the linear acceleration system. These are a couple of patches called utricle and saccule. These consist of some hair cells that are adjacent to crystalline structures called otoliths. And when we move, either um, up or down or front or back, so horizontal or vertical, these otolith structures move due to inertia, and they kind of tickle the hair cells, and that hair cell activity is fed into the vestibular nerve, so that's how we detect um, linear acceleration. So the, the total package helps us to navigate our way in space, keep our balance, and interestingly, serve to create a sense of self. The, these, going back, this, this vestibular nerve that comes out of this structure, it, it has a lot of destinations. One of the pathways that this nerve takes goes to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, then impulses are sent to the cerebral cortex. And what you get for our discussion is the fact that if you stimulate, let's say, the left side, or the left semicircular canal, you can activate lots of different regions on the contralateral, contralateral or right side of the brain. And similarly, stimulating the right vestibular apparatus will activate left hemisphere in these various regions. So some of these make total sense. Here you have a premotor cortex, which is where you get the idea to move. So if you are sensing that you're tipping to the left, premotor cortex will say, let's try to move to the right. Uh, somatosensory cortex is where we um, perceive inputs from the body, so that makes sense. And here, the posterior parietal and insular cortex are areas that have a lot of functions, but included in those functions are things that you could say are self-awareness. 
Interesting also that uh, parietal cortex, particularly the parietotemporal junction, is where we begin to see abnormalities associated with schizophrenia. So that's some background information. The, to further highlight the significance of right hemisphere in, well, in, in insight and psychiatric conditions, this condition, this neurological condition called anosognosia, which is a Greek, which is a coined term from Greek root words that mean lack of disease awareness. Anosognosia was, the concept of anosognosia was developed by neurologists from the 19th century that would explain a phenomenon whereby a person would have a neurological lesion that, say, leads to blindness or to paralysis or to paresis, weakness of a part of the body. And some patients that experience these neurological insults have apparent, no, apparently no awareness of it whatsoever. The person who has cortical blindness insists that she can see even as she runs into a wall, or the person with a right parietal stroke that leaves him with dense weakness on the left side of his body insists that he can cook even as he grabs the pan and it falls out of the hand and into his lap. So it happens often enough that it got its own name. And in psychiatric world, there is a, there is a portion of people with mania something that looks like bipolar disorder in the mania associated with these lesions is indistinguishable from bipolar mania. But in lesion-induced mania, we find that about 600% or a six-fold elevation of predominance of lesions involving the right hemisphere versus the left. So right hemisphere, the point of all this is right hemisphere is some very important real estate for insight or awareness as well as for mania. We can activate the vestibular system. Well, actually, we can activate the right cortex through activating the nerve in the left vestibular system. And one way to do this, which is used by ENT doctors and is used sometimes by neurologists to assess to associate to assess brainstem functions, is called caloric stimulation, caloric meaning heat. And in our example, we're going to talk a little bit the opposite of heat. We're going to talk about cold. So cold temperature stimulation. Um, if you suffice it to say, if you if you put your head thirty degrees above the horizontal plane, then the um, lateral ring or the lateral semicircular loop is now in a vertical position. And if we infuse ice cold water through the opening of the ear, so the ice cold water hits the tympanic membrane, it cools down the bony structures on the other side, it cools down the fluid in the semicircular canal, changes the density of the fluid, causes the fluid to begin to flow, which stimulates the nerve and tricks the brain into thinking that there is motion in the horizontal plane. And that vestibular information is sent to the right side of the brain in those regions, some of those regions that I poked that I showed you here earlier. Um, interesting, you could say, uh, you will say probably say it's even more interesting if I show you some of these studies, which say that in a person who's had right hemisphere stroke, which produces left sided paralysis or weakness, along with anosognosia or neglect of the affected side, that we can achieve remission of that neglect or lack of awareness, albeit very temporarily, by stimulating the right hemisphere through left cold caloric stimulation. Uh, suffice to say, several studies, and here, this last bullet point, galvanic stimulation means electrical. So in these studies, we're looking at cold water to achieve the goal. You can also achieve it with electricity. And however you do it, according to a small number of studies, you do get brief remission of neglect or impairment awareness. So the fact that we could achieve awareness of paralysis in people that had been neurologically 
damage to the point that their neurology made them unable to be aware of it. Those findings fed into the idea that we can maybe achieve right parietal stimulation or right, we can achieve right cortex stimulation by left cold water infusion. So we have a handful of studies which are very interesting. Dodson and colleagues in 2004 did a case study involving a 20-year-old woman with well-characterized bipolar disorder and during the current episode had not responded to what sound like heroic pharmacotherapy interventions. And she had five sessions of right unilateral ECT. I guess you can imagine if they're trying to move to electroconvulsive therapy that one, her illness was severe and two, certainly it hadn't responded to medications. And she had no sign of improvement after five treatments. And then she pulled the plug on the ECT treatment. So that was the situation. They did cold water infusion into the left tympanic membrane and found in young mania rating scale, so Weimar is a classic mania rating system, that she had high score and it dropped almost immediately to around 10 on the first time and to just about five on the second time. That's a, going from 30s to a five is enormous. Um, and in the narrative of this paper, they describe her as having, having essentially been mania free, having insight into her illness and being embarrassed about what she'd been doing when she was uh, experiencing her mania. Then they found that um, for a day, she was significantly better than she was. But by three days, she had returned to her former baseline in mania, at which point they give her another infusion, and they had a similar result. If you want to be very speculative with me, you can see that her reduction is numerically greater in the second infusion versus the first. If they had done this five times, who knows what would have happened. But the point is that they had almost immediate remission of mania symptoms that was moderately to slightly, depending upon if you're half full, half empty glass person, uh, effective or in, in moderately to um, mildly durable. Um, okay, that was that was great. Then, uh, then eight years later, it took eight years to try to replicate that. They had uh, Levine and colleagues decided to, uh, to choose a patient with schizoaffective disorder that apparently they had studied and knew for quite a long time. So they described this person as thoroughly studied or well known. And this person had mania. And they were going to target, they were going to try to replicate this this Dodson finding, they, but they wanted to have two other people without mania to see if cold water or cold vestibular stimulation was mania specific. And so that's what they did. Uh, they just did one session, and they found that there was within 20 minutes, a noticeable effect, although in this case, it didn't last more than 60 minutes. So in the previous case, it was two days. And in this case, people were back to baseline in an hour. But two point reduction in the delusion item from PANS. And if you've done a PANS scale, one is absolutely no pathology, two is on the borderline of abnormal, and seven is severe among the worst cases I've seen. So you only have five points between definitively symptomatic and very symptomatic. So a two point reduction is actually pretty good. And a five point reduction in the positive symptom composite score, also pretty good. And a one point, at least a one point reduction in the awareness or insight item of the pans. And so that was interesting. And when they came back to discuss the person with the mania, they did say they didn't rate this, but they said that there were um, signs of improvements to specifically in speech and distractibility. Again, so noticeable improvements, and to my mind, significantly with no change of medicine, and in this case, lasted 60 minutes. And so let's, at this point, I want to get a little editorial and say, in this technique, we have a way to reverse dense neurological damage in the case of anosognosia related to right-sided strokes. We have a way to uh, affect drastic remission of mania in a person who had been densely treatment non-responsive. We had a little bit of a nudge in 
or a little bit of a confirmation in this study. And so it baffles me as to why we have no more papers than we currently do. This is, this is we'll say, the completion of the psychiatric studies. This one was Gerritsen. They were focusing in this study on the insight component that um, Levine had commented on. And the design, fortunately, involved a large number of people, this time 16 individuals, with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder who were pre-screened to have notable, moderate to severe insight impairment. Same procedure, they did left-sided cold caloric stimulation of the vestibular system. They also did a comparison on the right side, which I think was a good element to their study. And what they and they they observed that um, when they did body temperature stimulation, they didn't move this vagus SR, which is the measurement of insight. They found that with left cold, vagal sti left cold vestibular stim stimulation, they did have a elevation of insight score, which was statistically significant. And when they did on the right side, it got numerically worse, but not statistically so. And they also they didn't do numbers for this. They didn't make a graph, but they did comment that psychosis and mood improved with left cold stimulation, and that psychosis and mood worsened with right cold stimulation. So also consistent with the story, this is bon bona fide effect, is that they measured nystag nystagmus electronically. And the greater the degree of nystagmus, which is a measure of the intensity of vestibular stimulation, the greater the insight improved. So it again, it, it, it paints a picture that this that there is a pathway from the left ear to the right brain, and that activating that pathway can potentially produce useful things like improving insight or possibly reducing mania or psychosis symptoms. And that's it. That is it. We could wonder, I mean, the obvious thing to wonder is what happened if you do it every day or twice a day? Nobody knows except for you can do this in Parkinson's disease, in which a single case study was done with repeated vestibular stimulation and gains were longer lasting. So the precedent for regular stimulation and durable benefit is established in the case of Parkinson's disease. Um, you don't have to use ice cold water. And for those listening at home, don't try this at home. There are some downsides to this. It's a little bit painful. It creates uh, a lot of, it, it creates vertigo, nausea. There you can be some vomiting. So it's not an um, extremely pleasant experience. And you have to do it. You have to take certain precautions so that you don't produce some damage. But again, because this goes to YouTube, talk it over with your doctor. <laughs> don't try this at home. Um, but you don't have to use cold water, you can also use cold air, or you can use electrical stimulation and the electrical stimulation can be applied to the to the um, uh, temporal bone behind the ear. So these would be easier ways and ways to maybe more precisely deliver stimulus. Um, uncharted territory. So I'm sorry, I don't give you a complete solution to insight and to treating psychosis and schizophrenia and bipolar mania. However, I do, I think this is really cool stuff. So I highlighted this just to let you know some interesting things. And also it suggests, or it certainly is supportive of the idea that right left activity imbalance is significantly relevant to the generation of psychiatric symptoms and or to the impairment of insight about those symptoms. And it does suggest that whether we do it through stimulating the vestibular system or through other points from the left ear to the right brain, there are certainly now some targets that we could look at for activating to um, correct this right-left imbalance. And I think Another thing crucially important about these findings is that there's a not uncommon tendency uh, amongst mental health clinicians to assume that lack of awareness of illness represents a psychological defense mechanism or perhaps willful denial. And the fact that it behaves more like the anosognosia related to right hemisphere strokes suggests that this insight impairment may be um, more mechanical rather than psychological in its origin. So those are the main points I wanted to cover.